As we settle into our cozy homes, we often take for granted the sense of safety and security that comes with it. But what if that very sense of protection was suddenly ripped away, leaving you vulnerable to an unknown danger lurking in the shadows? What if the creaks and groans you hear at night aren't just the settling of the house, but the calculated movements of an uninvited stranger who has made your sanctuary their own? Join us as we look into horrifying cases where strangers have taken up residence in someone else's home. But these intruders are not content with simply trespassing. They have darker motives and their actions can be nothing short of heinous. The Sinister Surgeon It was a typical day in September 2019 when Brittany and James Campbell returned to their Honolulu home after a week away, only to find something was off. The couple noticed a bike outside their front door, which seemed out of place. James went to open the door, but it wouldn't budge, and he heard a man inside holding it shut. The stranger calmly told him that it wasn't his house. James quickly grabbed a sledgehammer for protection, and Brittany called 911. After managing to get the intruder out of their home, the couple was in shock when they realized that he was wearing James's clothes. The man was arrested, but their ordeal had just begun. Upon entering their home, Brittany and James found pots and pans piled on top of each other, their bedroom in disarray, and their musical equipment missing. But the most disturbing discovery was yet to come. Brittany stumbled upon an old laptop that had been used to record diary entries about their family. These notes, titled The Omnivore Trials, A Rehabilitation for Rat-Like People, were filled with disturbing plans, including sexual reconstruction and a hand transplant. The intruder had also left knives next to the computer. Brittany later stated that he wanted to play doctor on us, and not in the cute little kid way. He wrote about how he could make us into perfect people. It became clear that this intruder had been in their home for much longer than they had thought. The Campbells remembered strange occurrences, such as doors being left open and the computer webcam turning on in the middle of the night. The man responsible for this nightmare, a 23-year-old named Ezekiel Zayas, he was arrested but then released for the burglary. He went on to allegedly vandalize a Buddhist temple and was later charged with murder in the first and second degrees. He pleaded not guilty and was found to be unfit to proceed. He is now at the Hawaii State Hospital awaiting trial. The Campbells have since moved out of their Honolulu home and away from Hawaii, trying to leave the traumatic experience behind them. The Denver Spider-Man In 1941, Denver was no stranger to crime, but the murder of Philip Peters left the police department scratching their heads for nearly a year. Peters, a retiree of the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad, was a beloved member of the community. He and his wife, Helen, were active members of the Denver Guitar Club, where they taught guitar and mandolin lessons. But on the night of October 17th, everything changed. Peters had been staying in his home alone for five weeks while his wife recovered from a fall that broke her hip. His neighbors had been kind enough to invite him over for dinner to keep him company, but on that fateful night, Peters encountered an unwelcome guest in his own home. The intruder, a tall and gaunt man, was raiding Peters' icebox when the two got into a scuffle. The intruder grabbed a cast iron stove shaker and beat Peters to death before fleeing into the night. The Denver Police Department searched high and low for the culprit but couldn't find any evidence. As they dug into Peters' past, they discovered that he had no known enemies. Meanwhile, Mrs. Peters returned home from the hospital to a house that was seemingly haunted. Food would go missing, strange sounds could be heard, and things would be out of place. Eventually, a friend of Mrs. Peters moved in to help, but even she couldn't explain the bizarre occurrences. The mystery deepened when the Peters' house stood vacant, and the strange happenings continued. The police received reports of disgusting smells and strange sounds, but every time they searched the house, it was empty. It wasn't until July of 1942 that the police caught a break. Detectives Roy Bloxham and Bill Jackson decided to keep the Peters house under surveillance instead of waiting for a call from the neighbors. 
Their vigilance paid off when they spotted a man inside the house. They ran inside, but the house was empty. That was until they heard a noise upstairs. They opened a closet door just in time to see a pair of legs disappearing up into a small opening leading to the attic. They pulled the man back down to the ground and finally caught their suspect. The man turned out to be who local newspapers dubbed the Denver Spider-Man, the murderer who had eluded the police for nearly a year. He confessed to the crime and told his story. The Denver Spider-Man, whose real name was Theodore Conies, had been living in the attic of the Peters house for months, surviving on stolen food and water. He had been able to evade the police by moving around the house through a series of secret passageways. The Farmhouse Murders It was a Friday night in March 1922 when an unthinkable crime took place at the Hinterkaifeck farm near Munich. Andreas Gruber, his wife Cecilia, their daughter Victoria, and her two young children, Cecilia and Josef, along with their maid Maria Baumgartner, were all brutally murdered inside their own barn. The disturbing clues left at the scene led German cops to a chilling conclusion. The killer could have been hiding above the family home for months before the murders. In the days before the horrific murder, Andreas had found a newspaper that he did not buy, and he told neighbors he had seen fresh tracks leading to the house in the snow, but none leaving. The family's last maid had also quit, believing the home to be haunted after hearing voices and strange sounds in the attic. It is thought that the family members were lured into the barn one by one before being beaten with a mattock, a type of pickaxe. The killer or killers then moved into the living quarters and murdered Maria and two-year-old Joseph in his bed. Neighbors found the mutilated bodies four days later after young Cecilia failed to turn up for school. Letters began to pile up at the family's mailbox and the family never turned up for Sunday church service. Eventually, a local man named Lorenz Schlittenbauer led a search party to find the family and was met with a horrifying scene. Elderly Cecilia showed signs of strangulation. Andreas's cheekbones were protruding from his skin. Victoria's skull had been shattered and young Cecilia's jaw had been broken. It is thought the seven-year-old lay injured but alive for several hours while pulling her hair out in distress. Maria and Joseph had suffered a similar fate and the toddler was killed by a heavy blow to his face as he lay in his cot. The investigation was hampered from the start, with vital evidence being lost when neighbors entered the crime scene. German police initially believed it to be a robbery gone wrong, but later found a large amount of cash untouched in the farmhouse. The family's headless bodies were all buried in a local cemetery and the farmhouse was demolished less than a year after the brutal slayings. The demolition revealed the murder weapon in the attic and a penknife in the barn. It was also clear that the brazen killer had remained at the house for some time after the murders, feeding the cattle and eating food from the pantry. A witness who passed the home before the bodies were found also told police that he had seen smoke coming from the fireplace and had been blinded by a person approaching him with a lantern. He had made a hasty retreat, but recalled an awful smell coming from the fireplace. In 1999, an elderly woman contacted authorities and claimed her former landlord had information on the murders, but his death meant the lead came to a dead end. To this day, the case remains one of Germany's oldest unsolved mysteries, and the haunting memory of the slaughtered family and their haunted attic still sends shivers down the spine of those who hear the tale. The Boy in the Walls Daniel LaPlante, born on May 15, 1970, in Townsend, Massachusetts, had a traumatic childhood marked by sexual and psychological abuse at the hands of his father and his psychiatrist. He attended St. Bernard's High School in Fitchburg, where he was known as a loner and unfriendly. However, his behavior started to raise concerns when he started making solo excursions into the woods behind his home. According to reports, a neighbor had become worried about Daniel's strange behavior, describing how he would frequently walk into the woods alone, and that's the only place he would be seen. After being diagnosed with hyperactivity disorder by his alleged sexual abuser, Daniel turned to theft at the age of 15. 
He broke into houses in Townsend, stole valuable items, and played mind games with the occupants. Daniel's actions turned sinister when he became fixated on 15-year-old Tina Bowen, whom he had taken on a date during Easter break. Rumors at school led Bowen to believe that Daniel was facing rape charges, causing her to break off the relationship. However, Daniel became increasingly obsessed with Bowen, and in late fall 1986, he initiated psychological torment on her family. Daniel entered the Bowen family's home in Pepperell near Townsend from a small crawl space, initiating a series of psychological attacks on the family. He started impersonating a ghost after watching Bowen and her sister try to contact their deceased mother on a Ouija board. Daniel played with their minds, changing TV channels, rearranging items, and leaving disturbing messages scrawled on the walls in mayonnaise and ketchup. He even emptied bottles of alcohol without drinking them and pinned a family photograph to the wall with a knife. The Bowen family believed that they were playing mind games with each other until one day they discovered someone had used their toilet while they were out. After investigating, they found Daniel hiding in a wardrobe, wearing a Native American-style jacket and a ninja mask, brandishing a hatchet. He forced the girls into a bedroom before disappearing somewhere in the house. Tina managed to escape through a window and contacted the police, who found Daniel in the cellar of the house two days later. Daniel was arrested and held in a juvenile facility until October 1987, when his mother remortgaged her house to ensure his $10,000 bail. However, two months later, Daniel committed his worst crime yet. While awaiting trial for burglary charges, Daniel LaPlante moved back to his hometown and continued his criminal activities during the day. In 1987, Daniel stole two firearms from a neighbor's house. A few weeks later, he broke into the home of the Gustafson family, who lived nearby. The Gustafson family consisted of Priscilla Gustafson, a pregnant nursery school teacher, her husband Andrew, and their two young children, William and Abigail. Unfortunately, that would not be the last time he would break into their home. On December 1, 1987, he armed himself with a firearm and walked through the woods that separated his house from the Gustafsons. Daniel didn't expect Priscilla and her children to be home at the time. However, things took a turn for the worse. Daniel considered running away, but instead, he confronted Priscilla with the gun. He then tied her to the bed and gagged her with one of his socks. After raping her, Daniel shot her twice in the head. He then drowned William in the bathroom and lured Abigail into another bathroom where he drowned her as well. Daniel didn't show any remorse for his heinous crimes. He attended his niece's birthday party later that evening as if nothing had happened. Andrew Gustafson, who had been calling his wife all afternoon, returned home to find his wife dead on the bed. He was afraid to look for his children, fearing he would also find them dead. He then left the house and called the police. Daniel went on trial for the Gustafson murders in October 1988, and a jury found him guilty of murder. He received three life sentences, but this wasn't the end of the story. Daniel appealed for a reduced sentence in 2017, but the judge found him to be unrepentant for his crimes. The judge upheld Daniel's sentence of three consecutive life terms, meaning he won't be eligible for parole for another 45 years. These cases and many others serves as a chilling reminder that danger can be lurking in even the places we consider the safest. While it's natural to want to feel safe and secure in our homes, it's important to recognize that danger can be present even in the places we consider the safest. In fact, the notion of a safe haven can sometimes give us a false sense of security and make us more vulnerable to harm. Next time you hear a strange noise in your house, it might not be just the normal creaks and groans. It could be an unwelcome intruder who has found a way to infiltrate your secure space. <laughs>